Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Leadership, Accountability, and True Hospitality with Roger Bodwin from Hospitality Innovation Labs. Um, I have a little bit of housekeeping to take care of before we get started while everybody is coming into the room. Um, this webinar is sponsored by Serve Safe Manager. Uh, if you are looking for a class that will help your employees satisfy the Certified Food Protection Manager requirement in the Washington State Food Code, uh, you could take our Serve Safe Manager class and they then get that certification going. Um, we are recording this session, so if you are missing this. Uh, or have to duck out early, this will be up on our website later on today and you can watch it there. Uh, we will give a Q&A after the presentation and we have the Q&A open. We can, um, once Roger's done presenting, we'll answer those questions for you on, that, on live. And it, we have one more cybersecurity webinar coming up next month, February 28th. Um, learn about cybersecurity and any tools you may need in case you are the victim of a cyber event. Well, and with all of that, I am going to go ahead and hand this over to Roger. Good morning, Roger. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, this is all about leadership and hospitality. And I call this a paradigm shift because it's really a new and different way of looking at your business. Um, over the years, I've done quite a bit of personal restaurant coaching, and it's rare that I see anyone approach their business quite this way. And if you stay tuned, you're going to see what I mean by that. But first, a little bit about myself. Um, yes. So I started my very first restaurant um, 30 plus years ago without restaurant experience, Call me crazy. Um, be careful for what you wish for because it might come true. And it certainly did in my case. Um, the saving grace for me was I went to business school and I applied systems and business skills to a business that isn't traditionally run by MBAs. And that made all the difference. So I've started five different concepts from scratch. I've sold them all now. I am the host of the weekly Restaurant Rockstars podcast. I'll tell you more about that later. I founded a series of training systems called the Restaurant Academy. Anything you need to know to either start a very first restaurant or if you're in the business for a while, it's everything to squeeze every nickel of profit out of the operation, train your staff for amazing guest service experiences and marketing that's trackable versus marketing where it's an experiment and you absolutely don't know if there's a return on investment or if it's working. So everything's in the academy. It also includes a staff training system called Sales Stars. I've been a two-time author. Um, I wrote a book called Rock Your Restaurant, which is kind of, it kind of chronicles my 30 year journey in this business and how I learned how to make money in restaurants. And also proud to say that uh, I'm a member of the Washington Hospitality Association with a company called Hospitality Innovation Labs, of which I am a partner. So more on that at the end of the webinar. So let's dive in. Um, the old way, and this is primarily pre-pandemic, but a lot of people still operate this way. There might be a mission statement that nobody really knows or cares about or even follows. It might even hang on the wall. Managers or the owners are thought of as the boss in the organization. We all know that word delegation. It means telling somebody what to do and maybe even how to do it. Employees prior to the pandemic were really expendable. If you're not going to do it the right way, there's someone who will. You know, you've, we've all had bosses like that throughout our careers, perhaps. And only the best people really rose to the top. So throw all that out. That's the old way. We're going to talk about true leadership and what that means. But first, what is leadership? There's a huge difference between a leader and a manager. And I've always believed that just because someone holds the title of manager or they've been promoted to be the manager does not mean that they're competent to lead others, that they're experienced, that they're inspiring or motivating of others to get the best out of people. And that's where a leader comes in. Leaders are far different than that. Leaders are people who lead by example. So when I own restaurants, I didn't work there. I put the systems in place. Most of the time I was a customer. I really liked the finances part of the business and the marketing side, but I put the systems in place so I was not tied to my business. I rarely see restaurant owners that aren't at their businesses 24 seven because the mindset is, well, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. And I understand that, you know, there's been a, a, a labor crisis. And I've got to tell you that just before the pandemic, even though I sold my four other restaurants, 
I bought another restaurant. So I've literally gone through everything that you went through during the pandemic and perhaps are still going through. I had the labor challenges. I turned all that around and then I sold that business. But I did it by leading by example. And we're going to get more into that. You can't be too important to sit in your office as the boss and delegate and just tell people what to do. Being a leader means you recognize talent in others. You nurture and you encourage those talents. You provide additional responsibility to people through incentives. And it's okay if someone is a fantastic fry cook or a busser and if that's all they want to do. That's okay. Not everyone is going to take on more responsibility. But recognizing talent in people and giving them the opportunity will make a difference in your business. None of this would happen without recognition and rewards. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then all of this thinking really leads to what I call a strong company culture. Now, there's a word that I love that I've used in my businesses forever, and I wasn't just a restaurateur. I've had several different kinds of businesses, but the word is intrapreneur, and maybe not everyone has heard of that word. We all know what an entrepreneur is. An entrepreneur is someone who takes a risk and takes on the challenge of starting a business, emotional stress, physical challenges, financial challenges, in the hopes of making a profit, and not every entrepreneur is successful with every business. So that's an entrepreneur. But those people who recognize talent can create intrapreneurs within their business. Now, these are people that think of the business as if they're own. They treat it as, as if they had to pay for it. They treat it like they own it, okay? They take pride in the business. They grow themselves individually as people and they help you grow your business. They mentor others and they share best practices and team spirit. It's so important in this business. Hospitality is all about delivering what we call amazing guest experiences. And then empowered people also reduce turnover because they're happy. This is what creates that company culture where people don't move on to the next job. They want to stay there because one, it's lucrative. And two, they enjoy the people they work with and they feel like there's upward mobility or opportunity if they want it. Okay. That's the difference. Those are entrepreneurs and empowered people. Now let's talk about that mission statement again. I started out by saying maybe it hangs on the wall and maybe it doesn't. And a lot of businesses have these mission statements, but no one really follows it. They become forgotten. And there's a huge difference between a company culture. You create a company culture by the way you lead your people and the foundation you lay and by raising people up and by giving them recognition rewards and creating this team environment where people feel a chemistry, a camaraderie, if you will, amongst each other. And that's mutual respect. These people are also brand builders, which means if they have a great time working for you, chances are they're spreading the word about your business on the street when they're not working to others, either through social media or word of mouth. So they're brand builders for your business. And when they're working, they're helping you run and grow that business. And we all know what a great company culture is. You just feel it when you're an employee that's really um, happy where you are. You can feel that there's a culture, even though it's not printed on the wall, you just know there's something special about this business. But the bottom line is every guest that walks through the door can feel that something special is happening in this organization. They just know that there's training in place, that people care about their jobs and each other. They care about delivering amazing dining experiences. And the end result is a great guest experience. Lower left side of the screen, you'll see hospitality, family, and fun. That was my company culture in all the restaurants I started because hospitality is the foundation of our business. My definition of hospitality, really quickly, I learned a long time ago that hospitality is absent when something happens to your guest. Hospitality is present when something happens for the guest. Huge difference there. It's, it's that simple. And we trained our people in that every single day. So hospitality was the first part of our culture. The second part was family. Our team felt like family. Our guests felt like family. And everyone had really great times. Everyone had fun. That was our culture. Everyone should have their own company culture, but it's not something that you try to create. It's something that comes natural by the way you lead your people forward and that you create entrepreneurs within your business to lead others and mentor them to be their best. Okay, fix what's broken. I'm gonna go back to that restaurant I bought just before the pandemic. It was a complete turnaround situation. 
Um, I bought it because it had multiple income streams. It had two apartments over it. Um, there was a beautiful New England classic barn on the property that was just used as a garage. I think the former owner stored a boat in there, but it was a post and beam barn. And I had this vision for turning it into this wood-fired pizzeria with a bar and a courtyard out front with Italian lights. And I'd bring in the acoustic musicians playing the sing-along songs and have this really, really wonderful place. And that was a growth thing. What we first had to do was fix the restaurant and the restaurant, a lot was broken with it. It was, you know, it was your grandmother's old fashioned breakfast place. It had an old fashioned lunch counter and it had the old booths and it was kind of an old and tired place. But again, this place had potential. Little did I know a pandemic was coming. But the very first thing I did, because people get really sort of um, uneasy when a business sells and they have absolutely no idea what are things like because people are resistant to change in organizations. I don't need to tell you that. But the very first thing I did was I sat down with every single person and I explained who I was and where I came from and what my goals were for the business and how I expected to lead it forward. I made clear to everyone that we had very high expectations and that we were going to have high expectations of the people. But the kicker was then I asked them, tell me what we can do to make your job easier, more productive, more fun. What's broken? Is anything, does anything need to be fixed here? And I learned a long time ago also, you don't ask, you don't get. But as soon as I asked that question, people started singing like canaries. It's like, well, the kitchen's too hot and it's 900 degrees in here and there's no rubber mats in front of any of the equipment and we're on our feet for like eight hours and blah, blah, blah. So we brought in air conditioning and we cooled the kitchen and we brought in the rubber mats. And then we went a step further. We bought everyone those really cushy, sketchers, comfortable shoes. And suddenly the kitchen is happy again. And now they're productive, okay? There was a baker. We had um, muffins. We probably made 500 muffins a day because it was one of the biggest things we sold. And the baker said, well, every now and again, the mixer doesn't work. And I got to kick it or jiggle the cord. And I'm in the middle of, you know, creating the, the batch. And it just stops working. Okay, we're going to get the mixer fixed. But if, like, you don't ask, these things are not going to come to your attention. So give them a voice is paramount. Flexibility. Now, this is a little harder, especially if you're challenged with labor, but everyone's got a life outside your business and the unexpected always happens to all of us. You know, we might have a single mom out there who's got a sick kid and she just can't get last minute childcare, whatever it is. But we have to provide flexibility as much as we can. And the key to flexibility for me was training or cross training, I should say, all of my employees so that each person that worked for me in every restaurant could do at least one other job. Because if someone called in sick or got hit by a bus or got the flu, we could call people. We had an on-call system where they're recognized and rewarded for you know coming in at the last minute on their day off, whatever it was but they could jump in. So we had dishwashers who could be fry cooks and we had servers who could jump behind the bar and we had hostesses who could bus and we had bussers who could host. And some people look at that as a cost, but to me, it was always an investment in the business. So there's another thing for flexibility. And then ask, what would make your life easier, happier, more productive, whatever it is, fix what's broken. Okay, the key to everything, especially accountability, is job descriptions. Now, this takes a little bit of time. It's like homework, but I've seen so many, so few businesses, I should say, that actually have an accurate job description for every single position in the restaurant. So I have a very simple template um, for this, and it starts, it's got three sections. The very top is what I call key success factors. Now, imagine a dishwasher or a host or a busser or a bartender. It doesn't matter. Every single person has certain skill sets or things they need to bring to the table, to the job to be successful. So I put five or six words for each individual position at the top of the page. And this is what people need to bring to the table or live by. It might be um, it might be reliability, it might be accuracy, it might be detail-oriented, it might be hustle for a busser, eyes wide open, whatever it is, key success factors. The meat of the job description is probably the most important. Every single job has very different primary responsibilities. And it might be five things in a job, it might be 10 or 15 or more, it doesn't matter. Every single one of those needs to be really thought through as if you did the job yourself once. And these are, this is what outlines your expectations in that job, primary responsibilities. Next to each one of those line items, there is a blank line. What's that for? Here's the accountability. When you sit down with a new hire or someone who's been in the job for a while that hasn't had a job description, 
you go over every single line item and you ask, do you understand what my expectations are in this responsibility? Do you believe you can do this to the best of your ability? Now, not everyone is going to be able to answer that piece of it because maybe some training is involved, but we let people know we're going to train you, but this is what the expectation is. And if they say, yes, I understand. And yes, I can meet that expectation. I have them initial that line. So now I've got five, 10 or 15 initialed lines that outline very clearly what I expect. Okay. There's the sign off. And then at the bottom, we have certain incentives for going above and beyond the job. Maybe it's a bonus or maybe it's a piece of the action. It's interesting. I used to have these training sessions in my restaurant once a month where we'd throw all these flip charts on the wall with Sharpie markers. And I would encourage everyone to throw out any idea because I knew that my people that are in the trenches every single day are in a position to see things, something that would work better, something that would be more efficient, something that might increase sales. It could be a marketing idea. It could be a maintenance equipment idea. It could be anything. And I said, listen, if I can, I'm going to put a short list together of all these ideas. And if I can track that those ideas either save costs or increase profits or sales, I'm going to give you a percentage of that savings or increased profit for as long as you work here. What an incentive that was. I had people that worked for me for 15 and even 18 years that were still collecting extra money in their paycheck because 18 years ago, they came up with a brilliant idea that I didn't think of that continued to work in my business. And this is how you build a company culture. So those are the incentives. So job descriptions, this is the foundation of accountability. We'll move on. Mentoring and shadowing, very, very important. Whenever a new hire comes in the door, I used to have that person shadow three of my best people. Let me outline really quickly. There are three types of employees in any business, A players, B players, and C players. The C players are those people that just show up for the paycheck. They're not doing your business any favors. They're giving bad service to your guests. They're just there. Half the time they're out back having a smoke or they're calling in sick. We know these people. They're, you know, you got to get rid of these people as harsh as that sounds, unless you think there's potential in them and that you can turn their situation around, you want to focus all your attention on your A's and your B's. The A players are those people that have amazing personalities. They're there for the right reasons. They have a true desire to serve the public with that word hospitality. They get along with others. They make friends every day, every shift in your restaurant, both with their team and their guests. And they're experienced, okay? You wish you had 20 more of those people. The B players have all those same attributes, the personality plus, the right approach, the desire to serve. Maybe they've never worked in a restaurant before or a hotel or an environment that delivers hospitality. All they need is a little coaching and experience. And it starts with mentoring and shadowing. So I always had new people shadow three different A players because everyone has a different approach and best practices can be a different style. And you're going to pick up something positive from different people. So that's what mentoring and shadowing um, is all about. Okay, let's talk about accountability. This is an interesting book. It's called The One Minute Manager. You might see that I've crossed out the word manager because I personally don't believe in that word. So I call it The One Minute Leader, but you get the idea. This is one of the best books. I ran my businesses this way for almost 30 years because it's very simple. This book is less than 100 pages and there's very few words on every page. You can fly through it, but it forms the basis of accountability. It's all about recognizing people when they do something great or right. And it's just the title, One Minute Manager. You, you're you're going to praise people when you catch them doing something right. But it doesn't have to be 60 seconds. It can be five seconds. It could be a quick pat on the back saying, Joe, I love what you just did. Keep doing it. That is a one-minute praise. There's also a one-minute critique. There's a difference between critique and criticism. Criticism is the old way, the boss barking orders at you and then yelling at you when you did it the wrong way. And chances are he did it, he or she did it in front of other people. And that is just wrong. So we call it a critique because a critique is constructive and it doesn't tear someone down. It just shows them that this is the way it was supposed to be done. And, you know, this is the way it's, I'm seeing it happen. So it really should happen in private. But therein lies the job description, because now if you're very adept in understanding of every single position in your restaurant, if you're an owner or a leader, then you can sit down and say, on this particular primary responsibility, you said that you understood what we expected and that you could do it to your best, to the best of your ability. 
I'm seeing you do this when you should be doing that. And that's the critique part, the constructive part. The difference is I'm not going to bark orders at you and say, now get out there and do it right. Instead, I'm going to throw the ball over the court to you and the onus is on you to correct the behavior. And I say simply this, what are you or what can you do to correct that behavior and get back on track to what you signed off and said you could do? And now they know I'm watching and they don't want to be called on the carpet again. And if it ever happens, they're going to go out there. And I know five minutes from now, they're going to be doing it the right way. And they know I'm going to be watching. And chances are that corrects the behavior. It always worked for me. So you monitor that change in performance. And then when you catch them doing it right the right way, either five minutes later or even next week or next month, you praise them for it. That's accountability. But you can't have accountability without setting the expectation and without having the job description. Okay, disciplinary action happens in every business, every hospitality business, every restaurant, every hotel, whatnot. But it really starts with having accurate record keeping. Again, there's a lot of businesses out there that have really sloppy record keeping. And again, this is homework, but if you've got the system in place and if you've got something that I call the performance leadership record for a file for every single employee, you literally document everything that happens. Whenever something great happens and there's a one minute praise, you drop whatever you're doing or you put a notation in your phone and then you put it in the performance leadership record. Whenever something goes sideways, there are minor and major causes of action for discipline. Something minor is somebody calling in sick more than once a week when they're not sick or showing up late and being perpetually tardy. Okay, these are minor actions. Something more major would be bullying or harassment or drugs on the property or something really, really bad. And that's when you need to decide. You have to have this in place in the beginning what the reasons, um, no, I'm sorry, what the consequences are um, and then have some sort of a consequence. So something minor, you might lose a shift on a busy Saturday night. Something major, you might be suspended or even terminated. And you have to have this in place in the beginning. But in that performance leadership record, you need very clear reasons for the write-up or the termination or whatever it is, because every state, this one included, has a labor board. And an employee or you know someone that works for you can go to the labor board and file a complaint against your business, and it's their word against yours unless you've got very crystal clear record keeping and documentation on everything. And it happens frequently, more frequently than you'd think. And preparedness is your only line of defense there. So it wouldn't happen without solid, accurate record keeping. Now, this is a flip. It's called a team review for owners and leaders where the team, the staff, actually critique the owners and leaders. I had a form for that too. And it was amazing because you can't just sit in your office and say, I'm the boss and no one can tell me I'm doing, you know, I'm doing things good or bad. I rarely see this, right? I wanted honest, valuable feedback. I wanted ways that we could continue to improve either my performance or the business's performance. Again, you don't ask, you don't get. And this, in addition to the recognition and rewards, led to a very happy, empowered team. There was a huge difference. I talked about the difference between management and true leaders. This is the difference between delegation and just telling somebody what to do versus empowering people, where you give them additional responsibility, you give them a chance to make mistakes, you critique their performance or praise that performance, and then when they shine and rise to the challenge and be an entrepreneur, that's when you give them an incentive or a bonus. Okay, let's talk about what some of these bonuses might be. Now, your leaders in your organization are in charge of different departments in your business. So perhaps you have a general leader and a kitchen leader, maybe even a bar leader, a dining room leader. We have lots of leaders in some of our businesses. So just some ideas, creating a loyalty program. That's a marketing thing. Increasing takeout and delivery, catering, starting a catering program or private parties and events. These are all additional profit centers in our business. Um, I started a mug club and it was one of the biggest things we ever did. But my bar leader is the person that executed it. And we started with just, we know what a mug club is, but I'll, I'll explain really quickly. If you've ever been to these sports bars and you see the mugs hanging there, it's a membership club where people pay on an annual basis to belong to the club. And then there's certain value added benefits attached in addition to the bragging rights of instead of 
you know, having a regular pint glass for your beer, you actually get a really nice ceramic mug. And in our case, we had um, four extra ounces of beer versus a standard pint and the discounted prices and all this. It was an amazing thing. When people used to come into my business maybe twice a month or three times a month, right? Now I've got this mug club. They just joined and now they're in three and four times a week and they're spending money. They're buying the food. They're buying my retail merchandise. They're drinking lots of beer and it becomes this clubhouse type scenario. And we charge $50 a month to, I'm sorry, $50 a year to belong to the mug club. And literally people came in all the time and they paid $50 to join. And we started with 25 mugs. And when I sold that business in 2014, we had 1,200 people paying us 50 bucks a year to belong to the mug club. And there were no strings attached. It was free and clear cash flow because it was sponsored. I had a sponsor that bought the mugs and bought the t-shirts and all the value added stuff that went with it. So that was about $60,000 a year that just came in the door because we had a mug club. But the kicker was, I told you earlier, that people came in now two, three, four times a week and spending went through the roof. And that was one of the most successful things I did. If that's an interesting um, idea for you, it's all in the academy that I'll tell you about later. Okay, lowering costs, staying in what I call the sweet spot. My kitchen leader, my bar leader, they were responsible for our food and beverage costs. And I had to maintain, you know, especially today with inflation and shrinking margins. You've got to find out what your sweet spot is, your food and beverage costs, and you got to stay there. And it all starts with inventory. I don't want to get off track, but I can't tell you how many restaurants think that taking inventory is walking around, you know, with a pad and pen, figuring out what the order is that week versus calculating the true value of their goods and services on hand at any given time. Huge difference. And you really cannot get an accurate food or beverage cost if you don't take inventory the right way. But the sweet spot, it's super important. Again, that's all in the academy. Cash cows. A cash cow is something that has very high perceived value by the guest. You put it down in front of them, and the first thing they say is, wow, it has what I call wow factor. And they pull out their phones, and they got to take a picture of it, and then chances are they're going to share it to all their friends on social media, and then it goes viral, and that might drive business into your restaurant. But the kicker is this. It costs very little to sell that item. It doesn't cost much, but it looks like a million bucks, okay? So I can tell you all about creating cash cows as well. Um, ordering efficiency, that's important. No waste, no spoilage, um, maintaining virtually no theft in a business. These are all things that cost us money. So you can empower your, your leaders to do that. And then my kitchen managers always over the years were empowered to create off the menu specials that rounded out a regular menu, gave people lots of interesting choices to tell our guests about, my people on the floor, and then they were also highly profitable items. These are all things that were bonusable. These were all things that people in my businesses created for our business simply because either they had the idea or I thought of it and said, I'm going to give you more responsibility. You're a go-getter. You're an entrepreneur. Go make this happen. And then you get an incentive for as long as you work for me. It was very powerful stuff. Battle stations. I learned a long time ago that this is the business of a thousand details. And even if we get 990 of those details correct, it's the 10 we miss that the guest always sees. So we had this program in place. We called it battle stations. Every single front of house employee was in charge of policing a certain area their tables, perhaps, the bathrooms, the bar, all this stuff, right down to the tables wobbling or chewing gum under the tables, whatever it was. And when they came in before their shift, it was part of the pre-shift exercises to police their battle station so that there was nothing a guest was going to see that was amiss. In addition to the big picture, I had everyone walk through the front door. A lot of restaurants have people come through the back door. They don't want their guests to see the employees walking through with their backpacks. I always wanted people to come through the front door because they got a set of eyes. And everybody was empowered to fix what was broken before the guests saw it. You see a dirty window, go get it some Windex and a rag and clean it. You see, you know, beer cans in the parking lot. You see a burned out light bulb. You see something, a poster that was advertising, you know, last week's band. And now the band is gone. It's like, fix it. They were empowered to fix things so that the guest didn't see them. So it was rare that anything got by my battle stations. Okay, we talked about this before. Entrepreneurs treat the business as if they owned it and had to pay for it. We trained on this every single day. We had a pre-shift exercise. 
something I also don't see in a lot of restaurants I've worked with. It doesn't have to be a half an hour. It can be five minutes, but really focus training on what does the guest expect? They want to be recognized. They want to be acknowledged. They want to be served. We want to deliver true hospitality. We need to have product and restaurant knowledge so that every single person that interacts with a guest has that product knowledge so that they can make recommendations. Tell the guest what we know they will enjoy and appreciate. Be salespeople, not what I call order takers. Makes a huge difference in your sales and your bottom line. And in the back of house, same thing. These best practices, we mentor and we shadow in best practices so that everyone treats the business as if they owned it and had to pay for it. A long time ago, um, I, you know, someone... Well, in every business, we see things break, okay? Plates break. Um, I had silverware. When I first opened a restaurant, it was an expensive steakhouse, and every single piece of flatware cost about $7. And three months in, I opened the silverware drawer, and half of it's missing. I'm like, where's the silverware? It was all ending up in the trash because careless bussers are just clearing their plates, and up, oh, there's a fork, up, oh, there's a knife. And over a couple of months, we lost a couple hundred pieces of $7 a piece flatware until we put a stop to it. So we've all heard of open book management. It's like I opened my, well, I didn't open my books, but it's like I created another one of those flip charts where I said, okay, here's $30 for an entree that we're selling. And now everything has a line item cost against that. Because before I did this, they thought every time Roger sells a $30 steak, Roger's putting $30 in his pocket, Roger's getting rich and we're doing all the work. You know, they don't understand that there are a lot of costs in this business and that if you're doing well, your profit margin is like 15 percent, 15 cents of every dollar of sales is your profit. They don't understand this. You have to teach it to them. And I certainly did that. So suddenly the silverware stopped disappearing and people were more careful and they weren't bla breaking plates and glasses because every time a seven or a ten dollar plate broke, there's ten dollars off the profit of the next entree I was going to sell. We made it very clear to people, and it really cut back on that. Okay, recognition and rewards that work. This is what powers the whole accountability thing and the leadership thing. So we had a program called Difference Dollars, and we did it in all of my restaurants. It was very simple. You can do it yourself. Every single week, someone was recognized for going above and beyond, for making a difference in the business. And maybe I recognized, you know, one of my team members, but anybody could nominate. And I always had an open door policy when I was at the restaurant working on finance and marketing, because I told you that's what I like to do. Anybody could knock on the door at any time and say, Roger, you got a minute. And I always dropped whatever I did because my team were most important. I said, sure, what do you got? And they're like, oh, you got to hear what Sally did this week. Oh, tell me what Sally did. Sally's a winner. So this is how it would work. Fridays and Saturdays are the busiest nights in our restaurants every single week. And not every employee in your business works every Friday or every Saturday, but you want to recognize everyone. and You want everyone to have a chance to be part of the program. So I did this twice. I would gather the whole team on a Friday before, you know, before the service started and the same thing on a Saturday. We'd be in the dining room. We'd be in the kitchen or whatever. And I'd say, and this week's winner is Sally on a Friday. And maybe it was Joe on a Saturday. And then I would go into glowing detail of what that difference was and what the person did that made that difference. And when I was done in glowing detail, just proclaiming what they did, then I would give them a $20 bill and a can of Red Bull. And I'd thank them very much. And then everyone would clap and then go on with their jobs. But it didn't stop there. I went into my office and I had a template on the computer that said difference dollars, big and bold. And it had stars in the corners and all that kind of stuff. All I did was type in their name, big and bold. And then in glowing detail, I typed what the difference was. We had all these inexpensive frames from like Target or Walmart, you know, the eight and a half by 11 computer paper size frames. And I framed these and we hung them up in the kitchen and in the employee area and in the employee hallway and where they hung up their coats and in the employee bathroom. And when I sold that, those businesses way back in the day, there was not a square inch of space. There were these differences all over the place. And the most gratifying thing was whenever there was a new person that, that was hired, whenever they were on break, you couldn't help catch them, you know, reading all these differences. And that really spoke volumes about how we operated that place and the leadership and the expectations and the high standards and all the stuff I've already told you about. And that was a huge program that really up-leveled not only the guest experience, but teamwork and respect. But the most important thing was the guests could feel it. And there's that culture thing again. It all kind of comes full circle. 
We also had lots of contests and team building and incentives where we gave out gift cards. I used to trade gift cards with other businesses in my area, and I'd take 25 different 20 or $25 gift cards, and I would go to a movie theater, or I would go to a gas station, or I would go to uh, you know different retail stores, whatever it was, and I'd say, would you be interested in 25 of my gift cards that you can pass out to your team whenever they do something great or use it yourself and come into my business if you give me a reciprocal amount of gift cards, 20 or $25 dom denominations that I can use for my team incentives. And it was huge. And the kicker here is a $25 gift card does not cost you $25. It costs you whatever your food cost is. And if you got a 28% food cost, it's 28 cents on every dollar for the $25 gift card. This is very powerful stuff. We did that all the time. We gave out movie tickets. We gave out prizes. Where do the prizes come from? We all work with suppliers. Perhaps you've worked with them for years. These big companies that work with lots of other big companies for all the products you buy, whether it's food service companies or liquor distributors or beer companies or whatever. Um, I was in a um, sort of a business review meeting a long, long time ago, and this is where the idea came from. And I walked by a conference room, and I think this was a large liquor distributor that I bought all my, my alcohol from forever. And there's all these prizes on a conference table. And I just happened to ask the person I was working with or giving me the tour and just talking about my business. What's all that? Oh, well, we work with all these companies and, you know, we ask them for all this stuff every year so that we can use it for employee incentives. I'm like, that's a great idea. But then he goes, well, we end up getting more stuff than we can actually give away. And a lot of it ends up clear, you know, collecting dust in the warehouse and a light bulb went off. And I'm like, you know, I've been doing business with you for many years and we spend lots and lots of money with you every year. Can I have any of that stuff? I'd love to use it for employee incentives. The very next day, the truck shows up and every single item, valuable stuff. I mean, electronics and nice wearables and neon signs and you name it just shows up at my back door. I had to clear out a supply closet to keep all this stuff safe. And there's the next gratifying thing. I hire a new dishwasher. He's working for me all at 10 minutes and he's doing a fantastic job. He's like hustling and he's like really getting into it and he's doing a wonderful job and he's really careful with the silverware and the plates. And I'm like, hey, let's go take a trip to the closet. And now you can see he gets all nervous and jerky. I'm like, no, it's a good thing. Come here. Thank you so much for doing a great job. I praised him right there on the spot. Then I opened the door to the closet. I'm like, you see anything you like? He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, pick something. It's yours. You're doing a great job. Thanks for working here. And he walked home with something valuable. And I love the prize closet. So again, we soon had that problem where we got more merchandise from all of our suppliers and we could actually give it away. So then we ended up giving it to our best customers, um, mostly mug club members. But this is powerful stuff and you can do it in your operation. Okay, this is where the rubber meets the road. You've got accountability with the job descriptions. Now you need to give people a performance review. And again, this takes a little bit of time, but it doesn't take as much as you think because if you've got those files I talked about where you're documenting praises and critiques and you know how well people are performing on every one of those primary responsibilities from the job description, then all you do is take the job description and you give everyone a letter grade next to every one of those primary responsibilities. You got an A on this, you got a B on this, you got an A on this, you get it and so on and so forth. And then you average that out and you give them an overall score and you sit down with them one-on-one -on -one every six months and you tell people how they're doing. And if they get a stellar grade, then you give them a bonus or some type of a reward for that. You explain room for improvement in the critique fashion, of course. That's really how things work. That's accountability. Okay, we also had a weekly leadership meeting. And that's important too, because you gotta get all your leaders together me as the owner, you as the owner, you set the agenda. You talk about what's coming up, but first you revisit what you talked about last week and you debrief the goals and the performance of the things that were on the agenda from last week. What worked? What didn't work? How did we learn from this? Did we improve from this? But it's very, very important to have that weekly meeting and then you plan again what's important for the coming week and what, can, what could possibly happen that we don't anticipate and that could be almost anything, but you got to be ready. But this is, you know, holding your leaders accountable to have a weekly meeting. All right. That's just about the end of the webinar. However, I need to tell you about a couple more things. The 
Restaurant Rockstars podcast has been going on now for about five years. We've interviewed 375 guests, and these are leaders in the restaurant industry, the hotel industry, hospitality of all kinds. We feature guest service, finance, marketing, um, technology is really, real important also. And I'll tell you more about that as well. But you can subscribe absolutely for free on every major podcast player, or you can go to our website. Um, we didn't mention that I have another company called Restaurant Rockstars, and that's really what started. Um, restaurantrockstars.com is the URL. But if you go to that URL, you can subscribe for free and get it in your email inbox every week. And we won't spam you. We record these guests just like I'm talking to you now via Zoom, and it's audio and video because some people like to watch, some people like to listen. So absolutely free. We're getting celebrity guests now. You see on the screen, Bar Rescue Hero, John Taffer. If you ever watched that TV show, it's been running for like 13 seasons. John Taffer is an amazing guy. Um, he turns around these failing businesses and sort of tough love approach if you've ever seen the show. But he was a really humble guy and a great interview. But we get some pretty amazing guests. And again, this is absolutely free and it'll help you run a stronger, more profitable and successful business. Okay, let's talk about the Academy. The Academy is everything I've learned in 30 years of running super successful and profitable restaurants in a simple to follow format. It's a crash course in running a stronger business. It includes logistics. Now that means anything that you would need to know to start a restaurant for the very first time. If you were like me, you had no experience. We cover finances. We give you an inventory system, how to calculate food, beverage, and labor costs and daily break even and all those important things to run your restaurant. We have marketing, which is, I told you earlier, trackable marketing, proven marketing ideas that cost very little money, but deliver really true return on investment. They drive new um, and repeat business in the door. There's efficiencies. The staff training is called Sales Stars. Whether you have a fast, casual restaurant, quick serve, drive through um, food truck, or a full service, fine dining restaurant, we have two different versions of staff training for those. And then new profit centers. You know, it's not just selling food and drink here. We teach you how to put the mug club in place. We teach you how to start a catering business. We have other guest experts, not just myself, that are teaching these courses and anything you want to do to increase sales in your business. There's lots of additional profit centers. So all this is only $59 a month. It's a membership, but there's no obligation to continue. We've got an anytime cancellation policy, but I've got people that are in this for years and they just keep learning, and you don't have to follow it. It's not like going back to school where you got to follow a textbook in any particular order. You decide what's important in your business and when. If finances are important to you right now, and you need to start that inventory and calculate your you know, food, beverage, and labor costs and all that, go there. If you want to put marketing ideas in place, go there. If you want to establish teamwork and respect in this whole leadership thing, there's a whole template for that in there, as well as the staff training and all the things that... Um, that I've learned in 30 years. So it's all there. Oh, and the best part is you can now give access to up to 25 people in your organization to the academy. You can empower them and say, John, you know, you're my dining room leader. I want you to do this. So it's all in the academy. Learn this and you can actually track their progress. And that's absolutely included for free, no additional charges. So 59 bucks a month. 25 people in your organization have access to this and you can track their progress and performance in their own personal dashboard. And it's available from any device 24 seven self-paced. Let's talk about Hospitality Innovation Labs because this is the company that is the member of Washington Hospitality Association. So hospitality and technology go hand in hand, all right? Technology is moving forward at light speed. It's changing constantly. And there's so many things. Every business has a tech stack. They have things, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily communicate well with each other. Some of these things become onerous. So if you need help in sort of De, you know, deciphering your tech stack and making things work more efficiently, we can do that. If you're interested in augmented reality, bringing things to life for your guests in new and innovative ways, the fast food industry is exploding with this, you know, special promotions and all that. We do it. Um, we create special custom apps for different businesses. But we also have this, what if we could do this scenario? You might have these crazy dreams saying, wow, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this? Chances are we can do it. Our team combines about 40 years of experience in both hospitality and technology. And um, we work with hotels and resorts and restaurants and bars. So if you go to our website, which is at the bottom, hospitalityinnovationlabs.com, 
Oh, it says .co. That's wrong. It's a .com. I need to fix this. Hospitalityinnovationlabs.com. You can contact us and no obligation, totally confidential. We'll actually do an assessment for your business. You can tell us about your tech stack. Tell us about any challenges you're having or even what if those, you know, what if we could do this scenarios and we'll talk about it. And chances are we can work together. So that's hospitalityinnovationlabs.com. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you were here today. Um, I hope you got a lot out of this. Maybe you took some notes, but either way, a recording is available. If you either want to catch something you might have missed, or it's obviously available for those that couldn't be with us today. So thanks to Washington Hospitality for hosting us. And now it's time for Q&A. Yes, thank you so much, Roger, for presenting this webinar today. Um, while we wait for people to type in questions, we do have a couple of minutes uh, for that. Um, Tell me, what's the most common question you get from operators? You know, right now it's about, mostly it's about labor because everyone seems to be struggling with that labor challenge. And it's really a different mindset there also, instead of hiring, because a boss is someone who hires. Okay, we put a sign in the window that says now hiring, or you can drive down any street USA and you can see the changeable letter sign saying now hiring. It's like, nobody cares about that. People just tune that out. And even if you're, um, getting any employees that way, chances are you're not getting the right people. There's a huge difference between recruiting and hiring. So this comes up a lot. What's the difference? The difference is you're looking for A and B players, not C players. When you hire, chances are it's likely you're going to get someone else's headache, someone who didn't work out at the last job because they're a paycheck collector, not an entrepreneur that wants to help you grow your business. So a long time ago, I'm going to tell you a brief story. There was a huge new hotel going up um, in my town when I was starting my very first restaurant about the same time we're going to have our grand openings. And I'm thinking, how am I possibly going to get enough staff when this place needs valet parkers and concierges and front desk staff and housekeepers and bartenders and servers? They need hundreds of people. I needed like 20 or 25 to start my first restaurant. So I hired this one person who was an A player right off the bat. And then I had a couple of B players. And I said to these people, I'm like, who is just like you with the same personality and the same approach that might not be happy in their current job because they're not recognized, they're not rewarded. Maybe they have a boss that tells them what to do. You bring me those people and I'm going to give you a hundred bucks. And that if that person stays for three months, I'm going to give that person $300. Now, that may seem like a lot of money, and 30 years ago, it probably was a lot of money, but it was still far less than it would have cost me to have high turnover. Here's the statistic. They say today, post-pandemic, it costs somewhere between four and $5,000 to have turnover with just one person. The average turnover in a new hospitality employee, or I should say the average tenure, is about four months. You can't afford to keep replacing people every couple of months, even if they last that long. And in lost wages, time, productivity, and training, it costs you somewhere between four and $5,000 every time that happens, and no business can afford that. So it's really about incentives. It's about putting leadership and a company culture in place and hiring A and B players and asking the right questions in interviews and not just taking a warm body off the street. And I know that sounds challenging right now, and a lot of businesses are struggling with that, but you gotta change your mindset if you want a stellar business and if you want your guests to have great experiences. Is there a particular quality you look for in finding an A player? You know, I always ask these off the wall questions that you wouldn't necessarily expect. It's like the person sitting across from me and I might ask something like this, what accomplishment are you most proud of in life? And then I sit there and I wait. And and if they can come up with something really interesting, and, and my questions were all designed so that they couldn't just tell me what they thought I wanted to hear. They had to really dig deep and remember something that they were proud of. And what would what would your fifth grade English teacher, your high school teacher say about you? And then I'd sit back and it's like, I asked all these sort of probing different questions. And I try to get the heart of what this person's motivations are. You know, what satisfaction did you get in any job? And, you know, aside from the typical questions. So that always worked for me also. Okay. We have a question from the audience. Which of the approaches discussed today is the most important to start with when attempting to turn around for a restaurant owner? Okay, it goes back to the title, which obviously was about leadership. Take a step back from your business. 
as business owners, we're all, we all get really, really close to our businesses and we're jaded sometimes, you know, the phone rings off the hook and we're not necessarily open to new opportunities because people walk in the door all the time without appointments, trying to sell you things you think you don't need, but you always have to take a fresh approach. Walk outside the front door of your business when you're not open and just kind of look at your business and try to look at it from a whole different perspective and try to see what the guest sees and try to just think about what the competition is doing. You got to shop the competition also. You got to play your best game, but you got to know what everyone else is doing. And then you got to think, am I a boss or am I a leader? Do I sit in the back office and tell people what to do? Or do I put a framework and systems in place that up-level the organization and up-level the people and the way they feel about working here? And do I have a true company culture or is it just that old mission statement on the wall? It's really very foundational. And then next, well, there are three foundational elements in any successful business. And the first one is staff training, development, recognition, and rewards. And that starts with leadership. But developing your people is paramount because it impacts every guest's experience. The second is what I call cost controls and profit maximization. You can't do that without systems. If you don't look at your numbers every single week and know where you stand, it's like you, you can be on the border of disaster and not even knowing it. Because again, we talked about how slim the margins are in this business. You know, it's really... It's really hard because everyone in this business works so hard for not a ton of money. Unless you get a chain of 10 or 15 restaurants and they're all doing two or three million bucks a year, nobody in this business is getting rich. But you can do much better by dialing in your financial systems, knowing what it costs you to open doors every day. That's your daily break even. Knowing your sweet spot, your food, your beverage, and your labor costs, prime costs they're called. If you don't know this stuff, and then if you don't know how to maximize profit, Menu profit is probably the biggest thing in the academy right now. There are so many menus out there where profits are all over the place. And in every menu category, the spread or the difference in profit is often many, many dollars. And oftentimes, lower profit items are bigger, more popular sellers than your higher profit items. And you're spinning your wheels, you're filling your seats, and you're wondering, why is my bank account not growing? Because lower profit items, your biggest sellers. And you can tighten up that menu where everything contributes a similar profit. And then you don't care what you're selling as long as you're moving the merchandise and you don't have a waste, a theft, or a spoilage program. So problem. So finance is the second thing. The third important foundational element is marketing. And again, let's go back to trackable marketing where every dollar you spend, you know if it's working or it's not working. Because the phone rings all the time. Some slick talking salesman says, hey, you know, if you do a radio commercial, you know, a lot of people are going to come in the door. They're going to hear about your restaurant. Okay, um, I'll work with you. I'll spend $10,000 on a radio campaign. And unless everybody that walks through the door says, hey, Roger, I heard you on the radio, which never happens, you'll never know if that experiment worked. And I see restaurants dumping thousands of dollars out the window on things they just don't know are delivering ROI. So marketing is the third foundational element and it's all in the Academy. All right. We have two more questions and then I know you have to go. Um, the first one is about the labor shortage. Do you believe employers have a higher expectation when selecting new hires post pandemic than pre 2019, or is it people still don't want to find a job? I think that's changed quite a bit. Um, I think that was a, I think that was something that we used as an excuse when we didn't have people, but employment is rising. People have returned to this business. New people, high school students are great people to nurture and develop. And even if they don't stay with you for five years because they go off to college or whatever, they're learning life skills in our business. The restaurant and the hospitality business is the foundation of our country and our economy. And so many people get their start in any career by working in restaurants. So I don't believe that. And I'm not really seeing that to be as much of a problem now, but you got a much better shot if you work on that recruiting piece versus putting a sign in the window or hanging a sign on the door that just says now hiring, because we see that everywhere. And that's not the way to get the best people. The whole approach that we talked about in this webinar, I guarantee you, if you practice it, put it in place and change the mindset and change your approach to managing um, and call it leadership versus management, you'll have much greater success. And our last question, how different is the restaurant business than the hotel business when using these methods? All the same. It's all foundational. It's all based on hospitality because if we have guests, if we interact with guests, 
each and every person that works in a hotel or a restaurant, it's their mission. It is everyone's mission to deliver true hospitality every single day, but it begins with knowing what that means and what guests are looking for. But it's as simple as we all go out to eat and occasionally we stay in hotels. What are your expectations when you go to a place, whether it's a hotel or a restaurant? I'm going to give an example. I went to a 50th birthday party, a very good friend of mine, a couple of years ago. And we checked into one of those name brand boutique hotels outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And we had very high expectations of the service we would receive based on the reputation of this, you know, international brand. Well, we walked up and the landscaping was meticulous and we walked through and the, the front desk and the greeting was fantastic and the check-in process was efficient and everything was great until we got into the elevator. We're riding up to our room and all of a sudden the elevator stops on a floor and the door opens and this was a double door sided elevator and the door that opened was to a maintenance closet versus out into the hallway to our room. And now here's all the cleaning supplies and the mop cart and all that kind of stuff. And we're like, oh, that's a nice impression, right? And it wasn't even tidy. It was kind of sloppy in there. So then the door shuts and then we go up and the door opens in our room. We're walking down the hallway and now two or three of the rooms had all the linens thrown on the floor outside the door. And now you got to kind of navigate around that. We walked around the corner and there's two room service trays with all the dirty dishes on the floor. We walked into our room and the first thing I saw was the glass window directly at the end of the room and it had all these kids' handprints all over it. And I'm like, this is attention to detail. This is not an inexpensive hotel. It is a nice name brand hotel and that's not hospitality, folks. So every single person, I talked about battle stations earlier. That's what you got to deliver, battle stations. All right. Well, Roger, thank you so much for your time and this information today. Um, to everybody still on the call, we will have this up on our website later on today, and you can watch it whenever you like. Thank you so Again. much for having me. It's been my pleasure. Stay well, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye now.